Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar today on what's going on with public charge. We're going to go over what the public charge rule is and what it means for our communities, as well as what does the Supreme Court ruling mean. And then we'll go into more about how advocates like yourself can take action. We'll have a Q&A at the end, but you can raise your hand at any time during the webinar or type in any questions in the webinar box. So we have our speakers, Darina Wong, from who is the project director for the Health Access Project at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Los Angeles. And then we have Megan Asahab, who's the director of immigration advocacy at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC in DC. So with that, we'll get started. Oh, okay. Uh, this is Dorena. Um, thank you, Mary. That was great. Um, so I, I just want to just give a little uh, caveat or warning. We are going to go through this PowerPoint presentation and it has a lot of information on it. So we, and we have done a similar one before. Uh, so hopefully this will not be new information for you, but we uh, are probably going to try to go through pretty quickly. And, and um, but you will have the slides for your reference to go back um, to, um, because we know, as I said, that there's just a lot of information about it. We just wanted to make sure you had this for reference. So, so the most important part, I think, of the webinar is probably at the end about the messaging and what you can do about this um, since the rule just went into effect. So let me just get started uh, by kind of explaining, you know, what the public charge rule is in, in the first place. Uh, we consider it what we call a wealth test. Um, you'll see in a few moments why we call it a wealth test, um, because one of the factors has to do with, with one's income. And, um, but it applies to uh, certain categories of, of immigrants applying for their lawful permanent residence. That's also known as trying to get your green card. And these particular public charge rules issued by the Department of Homeland Security applies to those within the U.S. They're similar but slightly different public charge rules that for people who apply outside the country, you know, the Department of State has issued. Um, and we're not going to go into those, but they're similar to uh, these rules that we'll be going over um, today. Uh, and the, as I said, the rule went into effect. Uh, unfortunately, on Monday, February 24th, and actually there had been some legal challenges to stop the rule. It was supposed to have gone into effect even last November, but uh, some some court challenges stopped it. Unfortunately, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, recently reversed those court orders that had stopped the uh, public, the final public charge new rule from going into effect. So uh, they're allowing these final rules to go into effect, but we want to point out that the legal cases are continuing. So you know maybe sometime uh, later this year we'll get some findings from from those courts, and it will again likely go up to the Supreme Court. In the meantime, unfortunately, we have to go by the, uh, the by the new rule. Now it's important to remember that this new uh, wealth test does not apply to citizens, you know, whether you're born here or naturalized, that if you, uh, or people applying for citizenship, and actually uh, we'll go over a bunch of other exceptions as well. It also does not apply if you already have your green card or you're already a lawful permanent resident unless you leave the country for more than six months. Um, so let's get into what this test looks like. Before the test, uh, it used to look at if a person was to become primarily dependent on the government for subsistence. Now the new rule will look at an immigrant who receives one or more public benefits that will go over shortly, or will likely become a public charge in the future. So it has become what we call a forward-looking test. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so let's look at the kind of benefits that you know, used to be considered and will continue to be considered. So they look at cash assistance. So cash assistance is a benefit such as a, a temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, or SSI general assistance. Uh, 
And, and they also look at institutionalization for long-term care, uh, that, that which is paid for by Medicaid. So those benefits will now, of course, be included in the new rule, but they've added some health, nutrition, and housing benefits. So specifically, there's going to be, uh, med they're looking at Medicaid, not emergency Medicaid. There's also some other exceptions that I'll go through shortly. And the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, also known as food stamps, and Section 8 uh, voucher and public housing. So um, next slide. And But you have to remember, it's very important that there's some public benefits that aren't included. So we have a whole list of them. Uh, a lot of these are not related, some are related to, to health and nutrition, like uh, women, infants, and children, Head Start, school meals, student loans, energy assistance, transportation vouchers. I want to, in particular, uh, point out that the ACA subsidies, that those, um, the subsidies that you get under the uh, uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act under the marketplace are not included. So if you receive that, you don't have to worry about it. So also benefits through uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program, put CHIP, and also Medicaid for those under 21. And then finally, the Medicaid for pregnant women and 60 days postpartum. Next slide. So I was mentioning that this is a, has been changed uh, to a forward-looking test. Um, before it was, you know, whether, you, you know, you, you used benefits. Now you also look at whether you're likely to use these benefits in the future so they can actually deny the applications if, if they considering some different factors that i'll go into shortly will look like you might become um, a public charge so that that test is is referred to as a totality of circumstances test and as i said there's a, a factors that they will consider and they've also changed the way they will look at those factors so let's take a look at that next slide um, so these different categories of factors like your age your health assets and income education and skills your family status in whether you have an affidavit of support. So these different categories, they used to look at all of these and weigh them. Uh, 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 weigh them. Now, um, the final rule actually gives more guidance as to which of these may be negative and positive factors. So let's take a look and see how these, uh, how they're looked at now. Next slide. Let's look at, um, let's see, uh, let's look at the age. When you're looking at age, now it's actually a positive factor if you're kind of in working uh, working age, like between the age of 18 and 60, and it's a negative factor if you're too young, let's say you're younger than 18 or what they might consider too old, 61 or older. Next slide. Now let's look at how they look at health. And so before um, now, it's a positive factor if you're in good health, of course, and it's a negative factor if you have some kind of pre-existing condition, you know, especially one that maybe um, costs a lot to treat or a chronic condition. So let's say if you have cancer or if you have diabetes or if you have uh, asthma and, um, and it, whether or not you actually have uh, coverage, health coverage to pay for that. Um, so if it's going to be expensive to treat and cause the person to miss like school, your work, or unable to care for themselves, uh, that'll be a negative factor. So they'll look at the effect on the ability to work and go to school. Let's look at the next factor. In, the, in terms of looking at your assets and your income, now it's a um, heavily weighted positive factor if you make... Um, 250% of the federal poverty level, which is relatively high. It's, it's 62,750 for a family of four, or 30,350 for, for one. And, um, and then they look at your, if you make less than 125% of the federal poverty level as a negative factor. So for that, let's say a family of four is making around $31,375 a year. So now, um, you know, they've actually, they've actually um, been specific about 
the level of income that will be considered. You can also consider like your cash, if you have a savings account, your credit score, uh, your fee waiver application, you know, whether or not you've applied for a fee waiver, that may be, you know, considered um, not a good, you know, a negative factor. And again, I mentioned your ability to pay for health uh, insurance. Next slide. They also look at your level of education and skills. Now, if you have a, a higher degree, a license, some type, some type of certification and some kind of um, specific uh, employment skills, it'll be a positive factor. Also, if you fluent in English or can speak English well, that'll be positive factors. And now negative factors are like not having a high school or secondary school degree um, or advanced degrees. Uh, and so also if you're you're a limited uh, you know English speaker that might also be a negative factor this is this and that is this that is a new kind of consideration that they never really looked at before so that's how and in particular I think this might impact our communities as well negatively let's look at the next um, factor the family status so it's related to your um, income because if you have uh it's a positive factor if you have uh if you're able to support your household as measured by the uh, 125 percent of the poverty level but it's a negative factor let's say if you are not able to support your household let's say you have a larger household and you're only making 125 percent of the federal poverty level so the number of people in your household has an effect on on the uh on your assets and resources and so that's how family status may be uh may be used and as you know a lot of our households are multi-generational and have many um people living in the same household okay let's now look at the affidavit of support now it is might be considered a positive factor but it's not heavily weighed as much as it used to be um, a lot of the affidavit of support is uh, provided by uh, your family member. And so um, they'll look at the relationship with the applicant. Also, it, they'll look at the financial status of the sponsor, the person who is uh, filling out the affidavit of support. And also whether the um, person would need whether the the applicant is likely to need the support so basically you know somebody with a lower income uh, or who are younger will be disadvantaged okay i am now going to turn it over to megan who will go over um who will be impacted by this new rule go ahead megan thanks serena hey everybody this is megan have with um I'm the Director of Immigration Advocacy at Asian Americans Advancing Justice at AJC. Um, so then, you know, it's really, really important to keep in mind and to share with the community who uh, is not affected by the rule, really. So people who are affected are people applying for green cards um, inside the country or outside the country. Um, I think that's the biggest group that will be impacted particularly it, it impacts people um applying for employment based visas but also but i think particularly people applying for family based visas um or green cards and so it'll be both inside and outside the country though the state department um guidance governs for people who are outside the country so it's just slightly different but pretty much the same um next slide and then um so for folks applying for green cards, here's just a, an example, you know, say there's a grandmother, she's, um, you know, taking care of children, um, contributing to the family, not necessarily getting paid, uh, and, um, you know, we assume she's older, so she's going to have that negative factor, not having high income, you know, uh, as Serena mentioned, if she has anything like high blood pressure or diabetes. Uh, you know, it's really likely that she could be found to be a public charge. So I think we're, you know, one category we're particularly worried about uh, getting a lot of visa uh, green card denials are parents of U.S. citizens. Next slide. 
Um, and then also people who are applying for non-immigrant visas, which are those are your tourist visas, student visas, um, temporary work visas, uh, are subject to the rule. Again, I think the people who are getting sort of higher income um, visas like H-1B uh, are probably going to have lower risk, fac risk, risk factors uh, for a public charge determination, but, but some of the tourist visas, applicants and, um, you know, people adjusting their status in the U.S., say, from student mm -hmm. visa to an H-1B, um, you know, will, will be subject to the rule and, and uh, could have a negative determination. Next slide. This is a really important piece for um, community members to be aware of. Uh, the rule doesn't affect most people who have green cards. It does not affect the people who are applying for naturalization, but it does affect green card holders who leave the U.S. for more than 180 days at one time. So um, when they come back to the U.S., the government is treating them as if they are seeking new admission to the U.S., which is a, a legal term, and it means they go through all of the uh, admissibility tests. So, I mean, the best uh, recommendation is that people do green card holders do not leave the United States for more than 180 days at a time. Um, they can come back and then leave again. Uh, I know that some, you know, especially retired folks are kind of binational. So um, I think for, for just, you know, a big segment of API communities who should really be aware of this rule. Um, yeah. Uh, next slide. Okay, and then this is all of the categories of folks who it doesn't apply to, and this is important because um, a lot of these categories actually have um, legally more access to public benefits. So it's important that refugees, that they know that the rule doesn't apply to them so they don't get scared from taking benefits that they're legally entitled to and um, either rule won't, won't affect them. So that's ref refugees and asylees, survivors of domestic um, violence who are getting VAWA-based um, green cards, and UNT visas, special immigrant juvenile uh, visas, um, and other, you know, humanitarian uh, protected groups. So um, it does also exclude benefits that active duty service members receive and for their families, their spouses, and children. Now, the caveat on these categories is that Somebody may have a T or a U visa or be in line or under VAWA and they haven't gotten their green card yet. And if they choose to then go through the family based system because it's faster, because those categories are, are backlogged, um, and maybe they marry a US citizen or have a child who can sponsor them and it'll be faster for them, then they would be subject to the public charge rule. So they, those folks obviously need to seek um, advice from a, a reputable immigration attorney um, before making those choices. Um, and then, uh, again, does not apply to naturalization. It does not apply to uh, citizens naturalized or um, born here. And we just want to make sure that that word is getting out because we know we've heard people have been disenrolling from benefits or scared from taking public benefits, even when the rule doesn't apply to them. Next slide. This is just another example. Mr. Kim, he's an older naturalized citizen. He has some negative factors. And of course, he's, since he's a naturalized citizen, the rule doesn't apply to him. So, um, not to be tricked by the negative factors. Same with um, Ken Ki, as a Burmese refugee, has some negative factors. But because um, She's getting her green card through uh, through the refugee program. The rule does not apply to her. Next slide. Um, and, and pick it back to Darina. Oh, okay. Thanks, Megan. So I, I think that you may be familiar, some of you may be familiar with some of these immigration um, facts about our communities, but we thought it might be just useful to kind of remind uh, remind folks why this is going to have such a um, 
big impact on our families. Uh, so as you know, might know one fourth of the U.S. population generally are immigrants in their families, and there's at least around uh, five million children who live with at least one undocumented parent in the mixed status families. Uh, and so, uh, so even if somebody in the family uses, uh, I think there's just a lot of confusion about whether or not if somebody in the family uses the benefits that it might impact, you know, others who might be applying for a green card. So, um, and so almost one third of those who get green cards or apply for lawful permanent status are from Asian and Pacific Islander nations. And in fact, because 40% uh, of family-based immigrant visas are from API countries, we think that this is going to really um, be discouraging people from uh, applying for needed public benefits. We also know that at least uh, 1.4 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders receive Medicaid or, or CHIP. And so it includes about 182,000 children. So that's a lot of a lot of people, a lot of AA and HPIs who receive uh, these health benefits. So although the rule doesn't apply to most of our community members, because a lot of community members are not eligible for a lot of these benefits. As I said, this, this issue has caused a lot of confusion and misunderstanding and fear in our communities. That the chilling effect has caused a lot of families to be discouraged from enrolling into or even disenrolling into these vital health, nutrition, and housing programs to help them get on their feet and thrive in this country. Um, so this fear, anxiety, and reluctance also to share any immigration information with any government officials for fear of being shared with immigration officials also has uh, means that our families may not feel comfortable applying for these benefits so let's look next slide let's we can actually see that this rule this is why we say that the new public charge rule will ensure a sicker and poorer uh, country because it has so many potentially harmful health outcomes. It's likely that it'll increase a lot of chronic diseases like obesity. It'll increase the malnutrition because it'll discourage people from getting, uh, participating in needed uh, food programs. It'll increase the likelihood of communicable diseases and increase the use of emergency rooms as a source of care if they don't have any kind of health coverage. It'll also increase the rates of uncompensated care and increase the cost to healthcare providers. It'll also, we believe, increase rates of poverty um, because when people are sick, they are reduced productivity in, in the workplace. And especially for kids, uh, if they don't have the right nutrition, it will reduce their learning ability and their um, ability, uh, decrease the educational attainment abilities. And also, of course, if you don't have, use any housing benefits, they'll increase the um, homeless, homelessness for our families. Next slide. So there's actually were studies to show what the impact, um, you know, on immigrant communities would be. Uh, there was one report that showed that if this, if that this rule was applied um, to everyone in, in the country, there would be more than 100 million people, or a third of the U.S. population, would fail under this new restrictive public charge test. Also, there's been studies uh, that. Uh, where pediatricians and parents have uh, heard about concerns about the racism and uh, the fear of, of immigrants being detained and uh, uh, reports, of course, we have heard of reports of uh, immigration officials doing workplace raids, that kind of thing. And it just would lead to the pediatricians have said that this fear has led to serious health um, problems for kids. There's also, uh, as I said, this is just one of a long list of policies by this administration, this federal administration, to target immigrants. Um, and it's, you know, starting from the Muslim ban going all the way to restrict refugees 
and the CIVs and just the general attacks and changes in federal immigration policy, which has caused a chilling effect. And it has, we have seen that it has decreased the use and enrollment uh, from vital health, nutrition, and housing programs, you know, regardless of their legal status, whether they're eligible or not. So we will, we expect that this rule will continue that trend. Uh, next slide. I think this is a repeat slide. Yeah, so you can go to the, the, the next slide. Um, so let's see, I guess we might have time just go to quickly go through uh, just a couple of scenarios. Um, this is like if a VAWA recipient wanted to uh, access some public benefits uh, and had the option of adjusting to her United States citizen brother. So uh, we wanted to just let you walk through how this public charge rule might impact this uh, VAWA recipient. Um, so generally VAWA petitioners are, are exempt from public charge. I think Megan went through the, the exemptions from the public charge rule. Uh, but uh, one reason why the VAWA recipient might want to go through the U.S. citizen brother is that because family-based petitions might be faster. But if they did go through that um, process, there, they would have to, um, there's different factors that might be considered negatively for that recipient. For instance, the poverty, whether or not they would look at the income, what the um, income level would be, and whether or not the VAWA petitioner lived in poverty. Also, whether or not the petitioner had, you know, English uh, proficiency or could speak English well. And also whether or not that petitioner might have a serious health condition that might impact the, um, the application. And whether or not the VAWA petitioners had used, uh, was using uh, public benefits because a lot of our petitioners and fam families uh, need these health and nutrition and housing benefits. So, so it would, I guess, the VAWA recipient would have to weigh, you know, maybe consulting her immigration attorney, an immigration attorney, whether or not it would be better for the VAWA petitioner to just uh, apply as a VAWA petitioner through the public charge uh, to be exempt from the public charge rule versus whether or not to go through the uh, citizen brother. Let's go to the next example. So let's say that there's a uh, green card holder who receives Medicaid, but has to leave the country for an extended period of time to care for their mother or father or a sick relative. So as we said, generally speaking, um, you know, somebody who has their green card or is an LPR is not subject to the public charge test. However, as Megan pointed out, if they're out of the country for more than 180 days, then they may be subject to that public charge test when they try to re-enter. And again, you know, there's different factors that uh, the person, the immigrant would have to consider whether they're under uh, 18 over 61, whether they had a serious health condition, you know, were they employed or whether or not they had education and uh, speak English well. So those are just the kind, again, we would probably advise that um, applicant or the LPR holder to consult an attorney to kind of weigh all the different factors and whether or not it would be a good idea for them to be out of the country for more than 180 days. Next scenario, or oh, next slide. So let's say there's a mixed status family that was afraid uh, of the impact of the public charge rule and they disenrolled um, from, uh, from the public benefits. Um, so we want to just make it clear that if a uh, member of the family is getting the public benefits, that is the person, uh, but is not the applicant, is not the family member who is seeking to adjust their status, that that should be, that should be okay. Because uh, only the benefits used by the person who is uh, seeking to adjust their status will be considered. And I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding about these mixed immigration status families. And so they may be afraid for anybody to receive benefits and that would be very bad if it's not going to really impact their ability to get their green card. Um, 
because also, you know, the, the, there are a lot of exceptions to the public charge rule. So, you know, whether they're a citizen or they have a VAWA or some other kind of UAT visa or humanitarian visa. So all of these factors always, you know, should be considered. And again, um, if people aren't sure, if families or applicants aren't sure, they should consult their attorney. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it back to Megan to um, follow up. Thanks, Serena. So uh, just kind of run through uh, talking points again. Um, basically what we covered, uh, community members should be aware that the public charge rule does not apply to all immigrants and specifically, you know, doesn't apply to the humanitarian visas, the VAWA UT doesn't apply to naturalization applications, and generally doesn't apply, apply to green card holders except for the 180 day outside the country ex uh, rule. Um, many benefits are not considered in the public charge assessment, and use of public benefits will not automatically make someone a public charge. Um, only the benefits used by the by the applicant, as Darina just said, for a green card um, are considered under the DHS rules. So, you know, U.S. citizen children using benefits or other family members um, that will not be taken into account. And um, slightly different rules apply to immigrants seeking visas from outside the U.S. Obviously, the public charge charge is not a, a bit, you know, as big a uh, part of the determination, but they still are looking at those factors that relate to age, poverty, health status, and, um, you know, so there, so there was an impact. And then, um, you know, the, the public is on our side, uh, and we really encourage folks to get all the facts and continue to push back on this um, harsh rule. Next slide. Uh, more because it's more broadly talking points for the public, the media, policymakers. We want to call this a wealth test. Obviously, the public charge rule is wonky and doesn't mean a lot. Um, people understand what it means to be a wealth test. I think people understand that this administration wants to favor wealthier and whiter immigrants. So um, we want to talk about how the administration has implemented a wealth test to deny, to deny green cards. Um, reduce overall immigration to the U.S. Um, staying in this country should not depend on what you look like or how much money you make. It should be about how, you, how people contribute to their communities, how they live their lives. Um, you know, family is the cornerstone of America's strength, and immigrant families deserve the right to reunite with loved ones, care for people as they age, and um, use programs that ensure that they are safe, secure, and thriving. Uh, this new wall test will ensure a weaker, poorer country and will be devastating to immigrant families and American communities. Next slide. So what can we do? You know, uh, next slide. We're obviously very disappointed uh, in the Supreme Court's ruling and that the rule has gone into effect, but we don't want to give up. <laughs> Again, um, educate folks need to educate themselves, um, you know, and seek uh, um, immigration guidance. But um, next slide, we also want to encourage folks to share their stories, um, share their stories with the media, or share their stories with, with us, and we can elevate them, or, or or just with their members of Congress, congressional offices. Um, you know, if people don't want to share their their uh, legal name, they can share the stories anonymously, or they can certainly share them with congressional offices so that they don't want it to be public. Um, and we encourage folks to meet with their members of Congress, call their members of Congress, and hear some information, and just say they want them to do something uh, to oppose the public charge test, um, and that, you know, our immigration system should not only be open to wealthy immigrants. So there's there's various legislation. Um, Representative Judy Chu has a bill that would defund the rule. There's going to be efforts to get that into the government funding legislation this year. Um, and I think there's another couple other pieces of legislation. So you don't really have to specify. I think um, most 
members of Congress know what this rule is, and I think you could just tell them you want them to do something about it to, uh, you know, stop it. Next slide. And we really encourage folks to, to join um, the Value Our Families campaign, which is dedicated to protecting and improving the family-based immigration system, um, you know, including by fighting uh, the public charge rule and other harmful uh, administrative changes that are impacting family-based immigration, such as expanded Muslim ban, which includes um, Myanmar. Uh, so right now, um, the government is not granting any immigrant visas for people from Myanmar or Burma, um, which is another way that they're, you know, lowering the number of immigrants to the U.S. Uh, we also, in the Value Our Families campaign, are committed to protecting um, the refugee program. And um, we will be working on a new rule that's going to come out in the spring. It's supposed to come out in the spring. Um, impacting the affidavit of support, which is related to the public charge rule and part of the process for applying for family-based um, visas. So there's unfortunately an onslaught of attacks and um, you can contact my colleague Bessie if you um, are not part of the campaign and you wanna um, join and get our resources. Next slide. And then here are some more resources resources on the public charge or wealth test, um, the One Nation uh, Commission report, and then the Pro Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition is the big the national campaign, and so they have national resources. Um, Advancing Justice LA has uh, Know Your Rates resources on immigration, on various to immigration topics, and in various API languages. Um, so that's a hub for those resources. And then, um, we have a, a blog on um, kind of the, the people and the organizations uh, that are behind this public charge rule and its um, relationship to white nationalism. Next slide. I think there's one more. Yeah. And then the um, California Protecting Immigrant Families website has resources that are particular to California because California does offer some benefits. Um, to, uh, to some uh, immigrants that uh, other states don't. So that's more specific for folks who live in, and um, serve California communities. Next slide. And here's our contact information, and I think now we're uh, ready for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Megan and Darina. We do have one question so far, but folks can continue to either raise your hand in the GoToWebinar platform or type in a question. So our question is from Daniel Lay or Lee, and it is, does public charge apply to those who are renewing their green cards after 10 years expiration? And what about those who apply to remove the condition on their green cards? Hey, I can take that. So no, um, and no. So. <laughs> When when people apply to renew their green card, they're actually just applying to renew the the ID, the actual card. It doesn't affect their status. So if somebody doesn't actually renew their green card, they don't lose their green card status. Um, I mean, that's just important to know. But people should re should renew that document when when they need to. Um, but it's not they're not actually applying for status, and so the public charge rule does not impact that. Um, and same when you when people are removing the conditional lawful permanent resident status um, that there that does the, the public just does not apply because it's an admissibility for like the legal see what the legal explanation it's a part of the admissibility rule so it only applies when you're applying for admission which you're doing when you come into the country to get a green card and you do when you're um, Technically, you're applying for admission if you're, say, undocumented and you're applying for a green card, but um, the admissibility rules apply when you change your status, too. Great. Thank you. And, Darina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, that, that was good. Yeah, she answered it. Awesome. Well, it looks like... So, we... actually... Oh, go ahead. Well, so, actually, I had um, forgotten to mention something before in my section of the slides. So 
it, you know, um, I, I, you know, when I was talking about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the type of public benefits that were not included, I forgot to, um, I, I forgot to include state funded benefits. Um, and that's important because there's a lot of states that provide some, let's say, medic, you know, Medicaid benefits to a lot of immigrants that the federal government doesn't. And so um, uh, that is confusing. That could be confusing to many people, but I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that um, state funded programs, even if they're health uh, or, or nutrition or housing programs aren't counted in this public charge rule. Great, thank you. So those are all the questions that we receive, but, oh wait, we have, um, we have Anne, if you'd like to uh, ask your question. Yeah, about the last thing that you just mentioned. So how about in California where we have Medi-Cal uh, coverage for undocumented immigrants? Right. That's why um, it's important. So, so that 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 would not count as a federal as a as a public charge to be considered under the public charge rule, because it's a state funded program. Thank you. Great. And I'll just give a few more seconds in case others have questions. Okay, we do have another question from Christian. Is there a list of which public benefits are counted as a public charge and which are not in California? Um, well, there's a lot of programs. I don't know if there's a list per se, but um, in the in the resources um, under the California Protecting Immigrant Families, there is a tool, well, there's a website there where you can get um, some fact sheets, but there also are a couple of screening tools that you can use to try to figure out if um, that if the um, if the person you might be subject to the public charge rule. Uh, so that you could try to use that tool to find out. Um, but to the extent that we have a list. Again, as I, again, because there's so many, so many programs. Uh, I don't know if there's an actual list, but generally speaking, we, you know, like you can find out on the SPAC sheets. It has the list of most of the main programs. Thanks, Darina. So it looks like that's all the questions we have today. But of course, folks can email us if there is anything else you have. Um, oh, actually, we do have one more. And Karen, it says that you are. Okay, yes, Karen. thank you. Um, is there any special consideration for undocumented juveniles? Is there anything that's more possible for them than all of these other all the other things you mentioned. Well, I mean, the one thing is, right, so that the, the right, chip program, and if it applies, if they're getting health insurance, um, it, the chip program doesn't apply to public control. And then if they're getting health insurance through like having DACA in California or New York and maybe one or two other states, that's not going to count against them. So, but that's the same as for adults, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, it's just that that won't count against them. But there's nothing. There's no special carve out for them if they're applying for green cards. That's what I was wondering. Mm. Yeah. Great. So those are all the questions we have for today. But of course. Please feel free to continue reaching out and thanks for your work on this. We will follow up with the presentation and the links in our follow-up email. So thanks everyone and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you.